in today's discussion. Before we get started, I wanted to remind participants listening through Zoom that simultaneous interpretation is available in French and Spanish. You can select your preferred language at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Would also like to invite those of you tuning in to submit your questions via the Q&A function throughout the session. And if you're using social media, please include the hashtag OECDAI in your posts on Twitter and LinkedIn. With that, please allow me to welcome the OECD's Deputy Secretary General, Ulrich Knudsen, to open the session. Ulrich, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Audrey, and uh, good, after, good afternoon to everyone. It's a pleasure to join you uh, here today, uh, along with the ITF Secretary General, Yong Tai Kim, and uh, all of our distinguished uh, panel for this important discussion on addressing gender bias in artificial intelligence data. As you uh, probably know, the OECD has been working for the past uh, six years to promote the uh, adoption of trustworthy AI. Today's uh, dialogue is our first public event focused on the issue of AI and gender. Fundamentally, AI is about helping people make better decisions. It holds vast potential for all areas of our economies and societies, from contributing to positive, sustainable global economic activity, to increasing innovation and productivity, uh, and uh, to helping respond to key global challenges like the COVID-19 or climate change. But we also know that AI comes with uh, both opportunities and risks, chief among them, are questions of respect for human rights, democratic values, and the dangers of transferring biases from the analog world uh, into the digital world. So today, with, uh, with the help of you, we'll take a, a deep dive into how data uh, that supports AI systems can impact gender uh, equality and what role uh, might be needed for policy. I very much look forward to hearing from our speakers and audience today. I also look forward to seeing uh, this issue become more deeply integrated into our OECD analytical work on artificial intelligence and in our ongoing project on data governance and uh, well-being. So uh, with that, uh, thanks again for, for allowing me to uh, open. Uh, back to you, Audrey. Thank you, Deputy, Deputy Secretary General Knudsen. I'd now like to invite the Secretary General of the International Transportation Forum, Young Tae Kim, to provide his remarks. Thank you. Um, thank you, Deputy Secretary General Knudsen. Uh, how are you, everybody? Uh, I'm very delighted that the International Transport Forum and the OECD are collaborating on such an important topic today. And artificial intelligence is not a new concept because academics started to talk about it already in the 1950s, but it's only today that artificial intelligence is really starting to change our lives. In transport, AI is used in numerous areas. It is helping to make transport safer by ident identifying risks before humans ever could, and it helps to improve urban mobility through better traffic management, Machine learning is also pro proving useful in logistics, in maritime, shipping, and in aviation. For all the undeniable benefits, we should not overlook that AI also poses some very real challenges. The sheer complexity of AI means that what it does and how it does is inherently intran intransparent. This poses risks, and we need to think harder about how to address them. Concerns around data protection are real. They cannot be simply brushed aside without risking public acceptance. Cyber attacks have reached new levels of scope and sophistication. We just cannot be complacent about the potential manipulated of malevolent AI applications. The first step to counter and mitigate potential downsides of AI is to put in place well calibrated policies, approaches, and regulatory frameworks that support innovation, but at the same time protect fundamental rights and democratic values. One of the things we can and should do is to eliminate the biases in the data that powers AI. One of the most important, but also most overlooked database biases we will be talking about in a minute is the gender bias. At the ITF, Work on gender topics is part of our strategic priority on inclusion and universal access. 
We have just recently published a study on gender and the transport workforce. We also approach today's topic through a second strategic priority, digitalization. In this context, we have published a much cited study on algorithmic governance. This report was done with our corporate partners board, a group of 29 private and semi-public sector companies we work with to explore future critical policy issues. Incidentally, we will hold a workshop with our corporate partnerships uh, board right after this meeting, uh, where we will be looking at this very topic with a specific focus on the transport sector. But let's start with this broader discussion on addressing the gender bias in AI data with an illustrious area of experts that we are all keen to hear from. So thank you very much. Thank you, Secretary General Kim, for sharing the perspective of the ITF and for partnering with us to organize this event. I'm gonna spend a couple of minutes just setting the scene and describing what we hope to do today. So first, with the help of our expert panelists, we're going to try to unpack a bit the relationship between artificial intelligence and data and specifically explore how data can impact gender bias in AI. We wanna understand how better data governance and policies can help mitigate this bias and even promote gender equality at the same time. As Deputy Secretary General Knutson said, this is really the first time we are tackling the nexus of these issues explicitly in a public event at the OECD, while of course our work on artificial intelligence from the outset has recognized the importance of data and the importance of addressing bias in data for the purposes of advancing AI. In particular, the OECD AI principles, which were the first intergovernmental standard on art artificial intelligence were, which, and were adopted by the OECD in May of 2019, aim to promote trustworthy and responsible AI. These principles include a specific recommendation to countries to promote mechanisms to support the safe, fair, legal, and ethical sharing of data. With the support of the network of AI experts, what we call affectionately One AI here at the OECD, we are now working to help countries move from principles to practice. An exciting piece of work coming together these days is called the OECD Framework for Classification of AI Systems. This is a user-friendly tool to assist policymakers in classifying AI systems by their potential impact, as well as providing a basis for risk assessment. The classification is a matrix of four dimensions, including importantly, the data itself and the input that goes into the AI system. The idea here is to essentially help link between the data that feeds an AI system and the system's potential impact in different policy areas. Another dimension looks at the AI model itself, where we also look at techniques to address bias in the data. We're about to start a round of extensive stakeholder consultations on this framework, and it will be available to use later this year. Finally, looking at data uh, at looking at the data angle more broadly, we have a new horizontal project on data governance for growth and well being. This was mentioned by the Deputy Secretary General Knutson. And this project seeks to support countries in designing and implementing better data governance policies. This project recognizes the importance of data generally to all parts of our society and our economies. And it recognizes that data, the, the digital economy and society, including AI systems, um, needs support to help countries maximize the potential of data in the digital transformation, while also addressing related risks, including biases. So with that, I have the pleasure of introducing a, uh, an amazing expert panel with you today. Um, I'm gonna first run through our panelists and then we're gonna get into the discussion that I know you're all here to listen to. So first we're joined by uh, Dr. Jenny Tennyson, who is the Vice President and Chief Strategy Advisor of the Open Data Institute. Jenny is also the co-chair of the Data Governance Working Group within the Global Partnership for Artificial Intelligence, the Secretariat of which is hosted here at the OECD. So welcome, Jenny. I want to also introduce Ms. Christina Pombo, who is the Principal Advisor and Head of the Digital and Data Cluster at the Inter-American Development Bank. In her capacity there, she spearheads initiatives that leverage digital technologies to improve social services. So welcome, Christina. We have also Dr. Uh, Antonella uh, Santuccione Chadua, pardon me, sorry for the 
for the pronunciation, who is a medical doctor and the head of stakeholder engagement at Biogen. Antonella is also a co-founder of the Women's Brain Project, which is addressing the influence of sex and gender on mental and brain diseases. We're also joined by Dr. Alexandra Mojislovic, who works at IBM on trustworthy and responsible AI as the head of AI foundations at IBM Research, the co-director of IBM Science for Social Good and an IBM fellow, bravo. And finally, and not last, but certainly not least, Mr. Lee Glazier, who helps lead the continual development of the artificial intelligence vision at Rolls-Royce and created the Rolls-Royce process and framework for governing AI ethics and data ethics as the head of service integrity. So I hope you're already impressed because I certainly am. Um, I wanna first ask our expert speaker, Dr. Tennyson, if she could kick us off and tell us a little bit about why data and data governance matter for artificial intelligence and anything you can tell us about the importance of inclusive data. So Dr. Tennyson. Thanks so much, Audrey. Thanks so much um, for, for inviting me to speak today. Um, so yes, drawing on the kind of work that we've been doing within the um, data governance working group of the Global Partnership for AI, I mean, we have to, um, as we've already gone over, recognize that data is, is a really core part of developing um, AI, um, especially machine learning. Um, we can think of it as the lifeblood of AI, but at ODI, we tend to think of it as infrastructure that we now just rely on. Um, and so the topic of how we govern that data has become really important. Um, it's got, com, come out of uh, just thinking about how you manage data within an organization to good data governance really being about how we as a society make sure that data gets to where it's needed, um, can be used in ways that, that uh, benefit, that, that help us progress towards the SDGs, to help us grow, help improve well-being and so on. Um, and it's also moved from being a, a kind of topic where we focus very strongly on limiting access to data and privacy to one that balances where should data be more open and available with where it should be more closed. And a topic that leads us into very naturally areas of equity and justice, like who gets to benefit from this. Um, and when we focus on data, we often think about kind of the middle part of, of, of AI. Um, so, uh, you know, the actual development of, of AI systems, but actually, um, uh, issues of data governance come before then when we think about what problems is data being used to address, um, what, it, what are we shining a light on through data, and they come into um, effect afterwards as well when we start to think about how is AI deployed and, uh, and used, like who gets to use it and, and to do what. Um, so we mustn't just focus on that kind of development of AI and the use of data in developing AI, but rather on the whole end when process if we want to tackle these issues around equity and justice. Um, the, 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 and there are a, a complex number of areas that we need to look at with, with any kind of inclusive data, gender, gender included. They start from when data is collected. What do we pay attention to? What do we choose to see? And we can see this in the, in the COVID-19 epidemic where ethnicity has a, a, a strong impact, but in some places isn't being, um, isn't being collected even. Um, how does, how does the collection of data impact on participation and trust of people who are taking part in these systems? And um, we need to recognize that the collection of data itself can have impacts on people and how they, how they feel about the systems that they're, and, and uh, organizations they're interacting with and how they feel about themselves, whether they feel seen and recognized in their, in their fullness of, of self. Um, there are issues around modeling of, of data, like the way in which we create classifications of things shapes the way that we think of things. And um, I have a particular interest around gender and how we uh, manage the fact that there are uh, there, there are non-binary people, intersex people, the, the fuzziness of our gender categories. Um, there's the historical nature of data, the fact that norms from the past are not our aspirational norms, not the way that we want our society to be. Um, 
And in other kind of area that we pull out in our paper um, within the um, data governance working group in, in the Global Partnership for AI, um, the fact that there's a majority domination of the data that we use, in particular English language um, materials, for example, also skews what we what we see and what kind of AI can be produced. Um, and then finally, there's topics of intersectionality. We often bite off like one particular topic, like gender today, when there when the complexity of our identities is. Uh, it is really important for understanding how AI and, and data um, kind of mirror our realities and affect us in use. Um, so I just flag those up as like, this is an extremely complex issue, very important, um, but no one approach or, or solution is, is going to tackle these, these broader kind of systemic issues. Um, what is important is that we take this really critical lens on the data that we use, the AI systems that we build, and have inclusion and participation throughout the process that is used in order to get those multiple voices um, heard. I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you. Dr. Tennyson, that was a perfect introduction to what I'm going to call the lightning round. So I'm going to ask uh, the other four panelists uh, to spend about two minutes each responding to the same question just to get the conversation going a little bit. Um, and so the question is, what has your work shown about the risks and benefits of AI in relation to gender equality? And um, if I may, I'm going to start with Christina. Thank you very much, Audrey, and thank you, Dr. Tennyson, for that, uh, because I think what I'm going to tell you builds perfectly on, on that. My job at the IDB is to work with uh, Latin American governments to promote the use and adoption of responsible AI. So while I quickly fell in love with the world of AI and the social good this technology can do, a lot of research also found that the old saying, all that glitters is not gold, holds true especially when it comes to bias and ethical challenges. This is also true for issues of gender equality and AI. And the more I see what is happening in the public policy area, it is more obvious that bias can start anywhere in the system. And more often it starts even before the data is collected. One learns that there's a historical practice of using data from men for fitting system that serves women. And the design of many algorithms ignores the sex and gender dimensions and its contribution, for example, in, in, for example, health decision and disease differentiation among individuals, or that recruitment software built on insu insufficient data favors white male CVs over female CVs. All these facts set alarm bells ringing in my head. There is also bias in the way AI connects gender stereotypes from the world of work. Harvard Business Review cites a word embeddings as bias aspect of AI like a game of word association. The systems can often associate man with engineering and woman with nurse. These don't reflect modern society or at least what we want modern society to progress. These are outdated views. And it's quite troubling that the systemic injustices and inequalities we've been fighting against for so many years has made its way into technology in ways we may not be able to control. The problem may have its roots in issues beyond technology. And beyond the data, there are still several challenges when we set out to build and adopt AI fully ethical algorithms to ensure, gen to ensure gender equality. First, depending on the method in which the algorithm was built, for example, supervised versus unsupervised learning, the algorithm could come up with outputs that are inexplicable by the organization that developed or, or the world at large. It is not just the data then. The model matters. Second, there is incorrect ground truth. That is, the algorithm was programmed with flaws. These data sets are labeled by humans, which sometimes have incorrect labels. And as humans have inherited bias, these biases often creep their way into the technologies we build. And the third challenge, when it comes to ethical AI, AI and data, uh, is building trust. The OECD, as you said, is working on a framework for trustworthy AI, AI that could guide the ethical development and use of this widely applicable technology. So AI has been called the oxy oxygen of tech as data, the blood of AI. AI has been called the oxygen of tech because it is present in virtually all the devices we interact with from phones, audio speakers, cars, thermostat. 
uh, it also has incredible potential to transform our lives in fields such as healthcare. In the future, AI could power new medical diagnostic techniques or would potentially allow uh, skilled medical practitioners to offer more accurate diagnosis, early interventions and better patient outcomes. But it's crucially important that we develop the systems in ethical and responsible ways so that the biases of today are not baked into the technology of tomorrow. And more important, we must first improve the culture to overcome the most pressing challenges and take advantage of the benefits of AI related to gender equality. That would be my take on what I've learned. Thank you, Christina. I think that's, a, as you said, an excellent follow-on from Dr. Tennyson. Let me turn to Antonella now. I'm particularly interested in the, in the brain side of this. Uh, what's your observations on uh, AI and gender equality? So first of all, thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my thoughts. I have to say that the work that we do at the Women's Brain Project, it is aimed to carefully address sex and gender differences whenever we speak about digital solution applied to brain and mental health. The problem anyhow spam across the overall field of medicine. And we have to say that in our days we swim in data and we are surrounded by an ocean of sensors. So theoretically the information that we could collect are enormous, but we have to make a very good sense of what we are actually uh, analyzing and the type of solution that we would like to bring to our patients. Um, when we speak about, for instance, recent type of work, I'd like to share an example that uh, was published uh, in PNS in uh, June 2020, where, for instance, it was shown that if you have to train an algorithm with a data set to um, interpret uh, chest pathology, the best solution would have come only when the algorithm would have been trained both with male data and female data. In other words, if you would have used just the male population to train your algorithm, the accuracy of the diagnostic tool was much lower if you would have trained also with female uh, type of data. And this is just to share that we need to have indeed data that are valuable, that are heterogeneous, that could represent the overall population if you want to apply that solution to that specific overall population. Otherwise, you might have a bias. As far as you're aware of your intrinsic bias, fair enough. But you need to be quite alerted and be aware that that solution then cannot be extrapolated to the overall population. When it's about the use of artificial intelligence to read our mind, let me share with you a piece of research that uh, I find very fascinating and that we're trying to finalize while we're speaking. So basically, we already have tools that if they are eventually download on your smart device that actually you, you can see on the screen at the moment, you're able to distinguish whether your brain might have a mild cognitive impairment, which is the phase before eventually a disease like dementia or Alzheimer's disease become manifested, if your brain it is having already Alzheimer's disease or if your brain hopefully it is working properly. That said, uh, of course, the potential to use such uh, uh, tools are enormous because it means that uh, you shorten the time your patients need to see a specific specialist to address the, the condition of the brain. On the other end, what we did was also to ask the algorithm, and this is very interesting, whether based on certain classifier which were correct, collected in the population that uh, we were analyzing for uh, cognitive performance, whether the algorithm was able to understand if it was a blue or a pink brain. And surprise, surprise, the algorithm can distinguish pretty well based on this classifier, whether it was a woman performing the assessment or it was a man. So I'm asking myself, where will we go? I mean, if uh, algorithm can discriminate to this extent, it means uh, certain characteristic, which are specific to the female brain versus the male one exist. And how are we gonna use it to, for the well-being of the overall population living in this planet? And this is opening some ethical discussion that I think should be at the base on any solution that we are developing. Before developing any AI-based solution, we should ask ourselves, which is the ethical implication of the use of this solution? and bring around the table those who eventually can provide an answer which represent the interest of this whole planet. 
Thank you, Antonella. That's fascinating. Let me move to, to Sash, Sashka uh, and see if you can give us a brief overview of your sort of main learnings, takeaway about the risk and benefits of AI relative to gender. Absolutely, and, and thank you for having me. So um, at IBM, I lead our, our strategy and, and technical works around the trustworthy AI. And, and I think one of the first observation is that uh, we kind of rarely even know what trust means, right? Because when we look at um, the way we design AI system, or, or at least the way we design them up until now, the main, per the main objective is performance, right? The main um, way we articulate the quality of the system is some sort of a performance benchmarks. We build systems that are very accurate, that um, have superhuman characteristics with respect to certain tasks, such as speech recognition or, or image recognition or text generation. But trust is very different. Trust means that we need to be able not to have a good performing system, but a system that does no harm, that the system that does not discriminate, a system that we actually understand how it works, a system that is safe and it cannot be manipulated. So a lot of the work that needs to happen in the AI field and, and some of the work that we actually do on our team is how do you actually capture these very uniquely human characteristics into something that is a is an algorithm that is a, a piece of software, right? How, how do you even translate that into maybe a metric or a measurement or, or how can you even evaluate them for, for, for some of these dimensions? Um, another important thought in that respect is that even when we are able to do things like identify bias or, or, or make a system maybe slightly more explainable, there is this question of how do we communicate it? How do we evaluate something that is so complex, right? Because if we think about uh, industries that surround our, our lives, um, you know, finance, healthcare, manufacturing, most of these industries rely on some sort of evaluation that communicates aspects of trust. Like when we buy food, there are food labels, drug labels. There are car manuals that communicate safety and, and, and ability to, of that system or, or that, that product to actually meet our trust needs. In AI, we don't have that. So I think a big part of, of moving forward in research, in policy and technology is going to be um, the definition of these trans, uh, trustworthy mechanisms or, or even users' manuals on AI systems. Today, we know how to articulate high-level trust policies, but we don't know how to spell them out on, on a very, on very detailed sheet that says, hey, the, these are the kinds of biases that I can measure. These are the kinds of um, situations where this system works or doesn't work, et cetera, et cetera. So that is a big to-do moving forward. Another thing that... I believe is really important is to think about bias mitigation before the system is even built, before we even go and collect the data, before we even go and design something, because the bias mitigation is our ability to foresee negative outcomes, our ability to say, hey, this thing that I'm going to build, this data that I'm going to collect to power it has the potential to harm someone, has the potential to, to uh, award some people more or less or discriminate, whether it's gender bias or, or other types of biases. So, so, and that requires all of us to be much more um, a proactive in terms of education and, and creation of better design practices. And again, looking back at other industries, uh, best uh, practices for safe design are integral in manufacturing, in software development, in anything. So how do we take that and make it a part of, of AI. So, um, and I think last but not the least, we also talk about the, the data and bias in data, but we need to also remember it's the data that we created. And mitigating bias from data might also, um, it, it, all of these issues with AI, I think we have to take a step back and, and think a little bit 
because it is us who created the data. It is reflected our society and it is reflecting who we are. So perhaps the bias mitigation has to happen a little bit earlier. And, and all these issues in AI are in a way exposing the issues in our societies. Thank you so much. That raises so many exciting questions. But I will first, um, I, I will, I will hold off and and find some patience. But go next to Lee. Um, just a brief overview of your experience and um, thoughts on the risk benefits for AI and gender. Hi. Thank Thank you for the opportunity as well of speaking on your panel. I, I think some of the things, most of the things I was going to say have been said around bias. And, and the whole system. I think, I think that's probably the one thing I, I would add is um, treating the whole AI system as a system. Um, last, last Thursday at the annual AI conference, your Karim Perse said, we have to look at this as a complete system. It aligns with your own, um, your own policy that you just, um, um, just released and, and even the UK's um, CDI review of Bias data are all now starting to talk about this whole system approach. Okay, I've got, I've got, I'm fortunate I come from a safety critical industry where we have to review things at a system level. And, and we are looking at some of those techniques around failure mode effect analysis, looking at the whole system, including the data, the algorithms, the modeling, training data, test data, production data looking at the whole system. I would say that there are things there that can be, um, can be brought across into the area of, um, of the whole system, both data, the algorithms and the models uh, at the other end. And I know you're pressed for time, so I'll, um, I'll hold it there. Uh, thank you, Lee. I, I think, um, you know, these virtual panels were always a little bit pressed for time because we think we can do it faster. But um, so let, let me move on to round two and go a little bit deeper. This was a fantastic scene setting and, and a, a broad description, I think, of many of the issues. But let me go um, a little deeper. And maybe, Lee, let me start with you since you, you had to go last. And you talked about being, you know, part of the safety world, part of the uh, you know, you, you're regulated, you have lots of rules around uh, how to do things. And it struck me that based on what you said, and also uh, based on what Shashka said, that um, we have lots of models out there to learn from, whether it's safety or privacy or security of systems. And I wonder if you could reflect on what that might really look like in the context of an AI system, as you say. Yeah, absolutely. Um we do have some very complex algorithms, not AI, because AI yet is not approved in a safety critical context. There's some very complex algorithms that do work in safety critical contexts. Um, we have to assure the trustworthiness of those algorithms. Um, and we have various controls that are in place. Those have been embraced into what has been launched from Rolls-Royce as the Aletheia framework. So right in the middle of that, there are five realization principles around trustworthiness. And trustworthiness there is being able to identify if there has been, for example, any biased data that has crept in or the data has become biased. Um, we're also looking at working with a recruitment agency, um, looking specifically at gender bias. And they're really excited that we could lift from a safety critical aerospace context some principles and philosophies that can be applied to gender bias within the recruitment industry. Um, what, I, what I would add is that right in the middle of that framework are the risk, risk identification techniques as well of failure mode effect and analysis. Um, and I think, um, I think those things are very, very well worth looking at, um, being able to, as you say, lift and shift from other um, contexts where we are looking even at gender bias within an aerospace industry, but around the bias of the data, the bias of the algorithms, especially if they're in areas where they are self-learning after they've been released to, if you will, to use, which could be public use, that then they can themselves mutate. And um, interesting what Antonella said, um, 
we've actually done some research looking at, it started off at identification of mutation with genetics. So how do biomedical science identify genetic mutations? And working with a consultant, that's now moved into how do we detect malfunctions within the brain? And can they be applied to artificial intelligence and data? Um, the interesting thing on the um, genetic mutations was they do use very similar techniques that we use within um, an engine, looking at an engine malfunctioning, those five checks that I mentioned for trustworthiness, they exist within genetic mutation identification as well. So it really is a fascinating field of biomedical science, engineering, genetics, and, um, and looking at gender bias. We can all learn off each other and, and need to. That 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 is fascinating. Thank you so much, Lee. Let me let me go to to you, Antonella, and and building on your earlier remarks and some that Lee just picked up for you, can you share some best practices and recommendations for the development and possibly the application of AI in the healthcare sector? Well, let me start with a remark, which is unfortunately not the most promising one. There was a recent publication, I think the 15th of March about the pitfalls of the use of machine learning for reading uh, CT scans and uh, radiography uh, for basically um, COVID pathology. And uh, as you might recall, already at the beginning of the pandemic, we had a huge um, movement among the scientific community to basically um, encourage the use of uh, artificial intelligence and algorithm to diagnose the COVID infection based on chest pathology. And unfortunately, it seems that out of the thousands, uh, I will say, of papers that have tried to do so, the authors of this recent publication, which made a systematic, um, systemic, um, systematic meta-analysis, came to the conclusion that unfortunately we are very far from using this type of solutions in a clinical setting. So the potential to be used in a clinical routine diagnostic setting is still far away. And um, not surprisingly, and also to come to, to the discussion we are having today, the main problem resides in the data set, it seems. Data sets are biased. They are not representing the overall population. Uh, they are not validated enough. They are not shared. One of the major problems it is the fact that those data are not publicly available. So the question comes, how can we reproduce this finding across uh, geographies, across hospitals, across uh, um, university or wherever we want to apply such solution? And uh, so, the, the question you pose is what could be one possible solution? Well, we published a, an article in June 2020 where we came to a call for the scientific community based on the following. First of all, we said, let's be aware of such biases. Let's educate the broad scientific community, policymakers, the lay public, each of us to the fact that such biases exist, they need to be acknowledged, and let's try to implement within the system eventually a tool, an algorithm, an algorithm that can recognize the bias, highlight the bias, and eventually fix the bias. This would be the ideal world. Uh, we need to have also explainable AI, which says why this type of decision has been taken and um, why this uh, conclusion came to, to, the, to the one who is used to, to, who has to use this type of information. And finally, there is also the reproducibility piece that I just mentioned even earlier. I mean, we should be able to reproduce this type of uh, conclusion across the globe. Um, and for me, while well, it's anyhow at the upfront to, to really have a useful AI-based solution applied in health, but applied to any field of our existence is that, as I said earlier, an ethical discussion starts at first asking ourselves, why are we developing this solution? Who will benefit this solution? Which are the potential inner biases? Which are the caveats to keep in mind? And uh, how ambitious we are in thinking that it can benefit everyone and eventually it does not. So this would be my recommendation. Thank you so much. Um, 
moving on uh, to Saskia, what's IBM's approach to unbiasing algorithms and how can AI be used to identify and correct gender bias? We just heard that that would be the, the best and I'm curious where, where you think we are on that, Saskia. Right, so, so, so a significant part of our research is going towards is how do you use AI to unbiased AI, right? But, um, and um, early on, several years ago, we published several of the leading methods and algorithms that in a way uh, help uh, practitioners or data scientists uh, measure or capture or evaluate uh, the amount of bias in a data or a model and then mitigate it. And you can do it in several ways. You can do it by perhaps transforming the data set into a more fair version of itself. You can do it by creating algorithms that have some notion of, of fairness incorporated in, in the learning process. You can do it by essentially observing the decisions of the algorithm and 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 processing them in, in real time to, to, to ensure better balance or, or fairness in, in, in the time of decision making. And, and one of the things that we did over the years um, was to compile a library of uh, bias mitigation algorithms. Uh, we call it AI Fairness 360. And it's a way of, of ensuring that we have technical capabilities to help us deal with algorithmic bias. But as I mentioned, um, and, it, and it's an open source, it's something that we donated to Linux Foundation. And, and the idea is that you really want to make, make it available to everyone because we are all better when, when everyone has access to these capabilities. But as I said, bias mitigation or, or using technology for bias mitigation is just a part of the, pro of the picture, right? It's part of the problem. And, and one of the um, really important aspect of these tools, we also have explainability tools and, and, and uncertainty quantification tools, but very important aspect of these tools is education because AI is a complex field, right? It, it requires really significant skills on the practitioner to be able to, to, to incorporate this into a system or a tool or, or to invoke any of these techniques. So the idea is that we need to be making sure that we have education and de development and awareness so that practitioners learn together with us and, and education and tutorials and demos and, and, and design are integral to these toolboxes. So they're not, we don't think of them just the pieces of software or algorithms that you plug in into your workflow, but we really think we think of them as a platform to, to educate the, the students, the, the, the practitioners, the researchers about how to incorporate or how to even think about fairness in their work, because it starts um, with that thinking. Another important dimension of, of, of how we think about uh, trustworthy AI is this notion of uh, what we call a fact sheet. Um, it's something that, that we uh, proposed uh, two years ago, and it's the idea that when we design models and AI services or AI systems, we also need to um, provide with them uh, transparencies, reports, on metrics, on measurements, on how these systems were built, how they were trained, how they were tested, uh, what kind of inequalities were measured or not measured. So this notion of a fact sheet is really important. And, and, and a lot of our work today goes towards essentially fostering adoption. And fostering adoption is difficult because we have so many different AI technologies. We have um, you know, decision support, we have natural language processing, we have speech, we have vision, and they applied in thousands and thousands of different applications. So it's not just one AI, it's thousands of different of AIs. And how do you evaluate them and how do you capture the right metrics for, let's say, healthcare decision, uh, COVID screening application, as opposed to face recognition, as opposed to loan approval are very different. Um, so the way I see it moving forward, uh, I would like to see really 
uh, enormous amount of work in the industry between researchers and policymakers to help define and shape uh, the fact sheets for different uh, industries for different applications so that we can really go from implementing the high level principles into really hands on uh, safety and, and, and fairness mechanisms in AI. Awesome. Th thank you so much. I want to move on to Christina, noting that we're um, we're a little bit over time and I want to move to Q&A. But Christina, uh, you're in our, our OECD network of experts on AI, um, focused on the group uh, implementing trustworthy AI. And I'm wondering if you have reflections on the role of policymakers in helping address this relationship between data and gender bias in AI um, from your experience there or otherwise, of course. Thank you, Audrey. I think to overcome the built, the built-in gender biases found in AI devices, data sets, and algorithms, take explicit actions. Policymakers need to think and set up the conditions to improve the global representation of women in technical roles and in boardrooms in the technology sector. By the way, there are several gender gaps when we talk about digitalization of welfare systems, for example. Some of them are in digital access or in ownership of digital devices, digital fluency, and there is even a gap in the capacity to make meaningful use of the access to technology. Many argue that the one promising way of ensuring that, that historical gender bias do, does not get amplified and projected into the future is to increase the diversity of participants through the number of women in tech. According to the World Economic Forum, only 22 percent of AI professionals globally are female. So I think policymakers need to have courage and be encouraged to ask questions about how the technology is made and used and then create robust and gender inclusive AI principle guidelines and codes of ethics and ensure its correct implementation. And this can be done through certifications of with a set of norms and observable, observable variables that expose how the principles are being applied. For example, making sure that there is intentionality in the data and the use of, for public programs or that the outcomes can be explained. I think that's, uh, that's critical and it's something we discuss a lot with our, um, with our stakeholders here at the OECD. Let me turn to you, Jenny, and say, um, yeah, you noted earlier, you started the whole session talking about how um, bias in AI is not just about gender. Obviously, gender is 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 port important and something we worry about a lot, and that's what this is this panel is about. But also, want to take a moment to see how we might extrapolate some of these points out to other um, areas of bias that we're similarly similarly concerned about when we think about governing AI systems. Um, thanks. I, I think you know one of the things with, with gender is that you know um, women are actually the majority, and yet we're minoritized, right? It, be, it becomes a it, and, it, and it demonstrates that it can happen with any characteristic that that um, uh, and that it is uh, so embedded in our culture that that is very hard to get away from. I, I think that the kind of contributions from the rest of the panelists are really interesting, and I. I um, uh, as I said earlier, the, it, it, we have to take this kind of multifaceted approach to understanding and addressing the kinds of biases that are brought about by um, because of uh, different use of, of, of gender and other kinds of characteristics. Um, and there's, there's often a real desire to use technology or quick kind of, if we just fix the data, then everything else will be okay. And that's not, um, that's not the case. Just to add to the rest of the, uh, to things that other people talked about, where I've come to is that what's critical is at these early stages to have that, that critical thinking, to think about what consequences might be. And the only way of getting that is through um, through having diverse people thinking around what the impacts might be of technology and then people responding to those concerns. And it's often the response to those concerns that is the, is the real gap. I agree with Christina that part of that is about getting more representation in the field of people who are developing 
AI and technology. But sometimes we also have to be proactive about getting participation of people outside of, of that field. And for me, then that's the um, getting better at that is a crucial thing for uh, and building that into our processes is a crucial thing for getting to a better place. The other thing I just wanted to highlight was this issue around measurement and evaluation of, of AI. We have to monitor what happens when AI is put out into, into the world, because often the consequences aren't predictable. We're dealing with very complex systems here. And so um, I, I think it, we need to have more reflection on measurement and evaluation of the results of deploying AI that we actually, again, use in order to learn to get better at the kind of systems that get created. I'll stop there because I know time's tight. Thank you so much, uh, Jenny. Let me move on. Um, we, we only have about five minutes, but let me pull, um, try to do two questions from the audience. And I want to just reiterate that since we won't get through all of them, um, we will do our best to follow up by uh, with written responses from the panelists. Um, first question I just want to pose, and really uh, anyone can jump in on the panel. What are some concrete solutions that could be used to mitigate bias on the data collection level? I wonder maybe either Lee or I, I might take it from Go for the it. angle of uh, digital health. And uh, I just want to share with you a piece of knowledge that does not come from data merely used or used predominantly for AI driven solution, but refers to the data collected for clinical development uh, worldwide during the time period 2015, 2017. This is a publication where some uh, clinical reviewers from FDA also contributed and was issued in 2019. So if I recall correctly now, I might miss the units of these numbers, but in total uh, in the clinical developmental program worldwide between 2015, 2019, we had 131,000 people recruited Okay, now uh, the number says that only 5% were black, 12% were Asian, majority were white and male. So I think that uh, if we want to fix the problem of uh, biases uh, in AI, first of all, we have to fix the biases in general, how we do develop the collection of the data within our society, because after all, AI is just a tool that is used to analyze what we do in our daily living. And so already, as you, as you see in clinical development, those numbers are alarming. So if you put those data set then within an impossible AI tool solution, that's the numbers that the AI will address. 5% black only, 12% Asia, majority male and white. Thank Hello, you. Shall I follow on then, Audrey? Go ahead, yep, go for um, it. Just to add on to what Antonella said there, um, we, if you like, a lot of the data comes from a biased society. So there we have a problem. Um, those five checks I mentioned that are in the trustworthiness part of the Aletheia framework are there to identify that bias exists. And we can do that with various techniques. And one of those techniques is to compare what's coming out of an AI system with what you would expect to come out. So things like looking at pure sense check, is it wildly out? If, if we're doing recruitment and the CVs that have been put forward for interview are male, white, middle-aged, all from London, then quite clearly there's something gone very wrong there. That's an extreme, but we can do techniques in there. And one thing that we do do is we synthesize data. So, we, we have, if it's, um, an, if it's a, an air, aircraft system, then we'll synthesize aircraft flights. We have a million of them that are fully synthesized and we can randomly select them. You could do that with synthesized CVs and you can synthesize the data and you can, you can do that with a committee to ensure that you've got full representation in creating the data and then fill the gaps with code. Um, so there are various techniques that, um, that we are doing um, and we're putting a whole quality assurance process around the creation of our AI algorithms and models and training data, et cetera. 
And that's hard work because it doesn't really exist for an end-to-end -end quality assurance process, but we have to do it. Thank you, Lee. Um, we have quite a few other interesting questions. I'm afraid I'll have to leave them for written follow-up, but a lot around the idea of how, you know, we've heard a lot about getting ahead of even designing the system. So it's sort of the planning phase of technology where you really have to articulate bias. So I think there's a lot of interesting questions here about how to do that, um, and that we could put some more pen to paper um, from the panelists. And I thank them in advance for their willingness to do that and their, uh, their patience with that. Um, I want to um, turn back to uh, Secretary General Kim and um, Deputy Secretary General Knudsen for some closing and final remarks. And so uh, first, uh, Secretary General Kim, um, the floor is yours. Thank you, Audrey, and thank you, everybody. Uh, especially thank uh, Director, Deputy Secretary General Knudsen. And also, uh, I really like to thank my colleagues in the OECD family, uh, especially uh, Directorate for Science, Technology, and Innovation for fruitful uh, collaboration and fruitful uh, work of today. And I would like to remind all the audience that we have a very uh, efficient uh, uh, group called Friends of Digital in the OECD uh, context. And also we have an uh, uh, excellent platform called Friends of Gender in the OECD, OECD, OECD uh, context. Those platforms can be uh, nicely connected. And if we focus more on the transport sector, ITF is also focusing on gender issues, tackling uh, this question from uh, uh, different perspectives. Uh, for example, uh, the travel pattern and safety and security, and even employment. So uh, we, we try to provide you uh, with uh, the evidence-based, the data analysis and the fact-finding and et cetera. So I think um, we will continue to work and uh, going beyond the OECD, and ITF is also working together with international organizations like APEC, and Women's Forum, of course, and uh, Union Internationale de Transport Public and uh, Multilateral Development Bank. So we are ready to cooperate and this kind of collaboration inside the OECD and also a co cooperation with external partners will create a lot of synergies. So thank you very much for your attention and we will continue to do our best. Thank you, Secretary General Kim. Let me now turn to Deputy Secretary General Knudsen. Thank you very much, uh, Audrey. Thank you to, to the panel. I really learned a lot over the last uh, hour or so. Thank you to, uh, to Secretary General Kim uh, as, as well. I, um, I worked in my previous job uh, a lot with uh, gender bias, and I am uh, very much convinced that we do have uh, uh, hidden gender biases, even in the analog world. And uh, of course, uh, now the, 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 the big task upon us is to, uh, to make sure that we don't uh, take those biases with us into the digital world, or we may even we may even exacerbate these uh, biases. Uh, I think first of all we need to we need to, you know, disseminate the the the, the message that this is a real issue. Uh, there is absolutely no reason to presume that uh, that gender bias will not be present in the digital world now that we have established that it is present in the analog world. Uh, we don't have much insight into the into the data uh, sets, uh, and uh, therefore we have uh, we have difficulty in assessing uh, whether whether there is a gender uh, bias. Um, also, uh, with 22% of women uh, only empowered in in STEM, or no, only 22% of all AI professionals are, are female, there's even more reason, I think, uh, uh, to to look at this with uh, with great uh, seriousness. Uh, uh, so, so I think information and education uh, will be two key uh, concepts uh, going forward. We need to educate our AI uh, practitioners in general, but also uh, in terms of uh, in terms of this uh, gender bias uh, issue. So, thanks again. I learned a lot. I I think we need to uh, commit ourselves to work together on uh, on uh, on on this uh, issue. And back to you, Audrey. Thanks very much to Secretary General Kim and Deputy Secretary General Knudsen for joining this important discussion today. Obviously, I want to thank our expert panel speakers for sharing their insights and their experience, and to our OECD and ITF policy community, from experts to ambassadors for tuning in and asking great questions. I also want to thank the team at the OECD that made this happen um, and put this on, so thank you to the staff. 
Um, keep an eye out on our event page for the video and summary of today, today's events, which we will have posted in the upcoming days. I also want to invite you to stay in touch with us on Twitter at OECD Innovation and at ITF Forum, and encourage you to check out the OECD.AI Policy Observatory. It's got lots of cool data about what's happening in AI, and I wish you all a great day wherever you are. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Thank you, Audrey. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.